Okay, so this is your Friday reading. And um, so we're going to do the story of Christianity 119 to 121. So I was actually probably supposed to start with the Great Schism of the West there. So just talking about how um, the Roman populace had made it clear that they wanted an Italian, not a French Pope. Remember, there were two popes. You ended up with two popes. Um, so the archbishop, the last non-cardinal to be elected pope, was duly brought to Rome and proclaimed Urban VI. His autocratic manner, however, soon disconcerted the French cardinals who had elected him. At one point, he had six cardinals under torture, five of whom were simply to disappear. And the cardinals therefore left Rome for the town of Anagni, claiming that Urban's election had been invalid as they had been in fear of their lives from the Roman mob. So they moved to Frondi, where they elected a new pope, and thus began the great schism of the West. Clement took up residence in Avignon, and the church was faced with the dilemma, to whom should loyalty be given? The theologians claimed that only a church council could decide who was the legitimate pope. It was a legalistic nightmare with the unity of the Western church hanging in the balance. A council was called to meet at Pisa to decide the, rate, the fate of the two contending bishops. Urban in Rome, Clement in Avignon. Before the convocation of the council, however, both pope and anti-pope pope died. And they were succeeded by Boniface IX and Benedict XIII, respectively. The council had eventually met in Pisa in 1409, complicated the matter by electing the Greek cardinal Pietro Falegri as Pope Alexander V, calling on others to resign. Okay, so basically what we've just got, though, is we've got all these different popes <laughs> in these different places, and they don't have one sole leader, okay? So that's what I wanted you to just um, <coughs> keep in mind. Um, and there's a picture there, too, of the palace of the popes in Avignon, France. So the papacy, so the cost of the hierarchy, it says here, it says during its captivity and schism, the papacy was in no condition to reform the church. In fact, its money raising measures were often corrupting. Some clergy were forced to pay a tax to the Pope when they entered a new, uh, a new office, they recouped the money from their flocks. So they would have to pay money to get in and they'd get the money back from the people. Um, the critics of the papacy multiplied and we have got John Wycliffe that comes in and um and um oh, so we've got we've got popes not doing a good job <laughs> so um and so there's going to be a cry for change on 121 uh significant attempts at reform in germany and the netherlands the largely lay movement called the brethren of the common life inspired by the great mission preacher gerard groot did important evangelistic and pastoral work and ran excellent schools whose most famous product was Thomas A. Kempis, an author of the devotional classic, The Imitation of Christ. They were supported by the German and Dutch bishops and synods ordered clergy to preach on Sundays and on holy days, the holy scripture of the Old and New Testament plainly and intelligibly. So we're getting a, a turn here, right? Uh, much influenced by John Wycliffe, um, uh, John Hus, who was a, uh, a reformer, declared that the church had departed from the Bible. He was burned at the stake, but his followers remained supreme in the Czech lands, defeating several crusades against them. The Christian laity were perhaps more educated and articulate than ever before. So the general population is more articulated and, and educated than ever before. The long traumas of the popes combined with non-residence and pluralism, so not living in Rome and all these um, you know, different things that are going on, left the clergy in a disordered, undisciplined state, and the monasteries were even worse. The situation cried out for reform, lest the tension between the spiritual clergy of the general population and the lack of leadership at the center should reach a breaking point. Okay, so we've got that, and then we've got um, what I really wanted to focus on. Oh, let me just see if there were any of those questions that I wanted to touch on, 119 to 121. The anti-pope died. That's a person claiming to be the pope. Um, um, the great schism of the West referred to a period where there were two or more popes living and supposedly serving at the same time between 1378 and 1414. And be, they were unclear, obviously, about who legitimately held power, but they also created another problem. So you know, their character certainly brought no joy or glory to the church. When one of them was even a former pirate, it seemed things could get hardly much worse. And then um, 
there were three popes. There were basically three different people that decided to resign at the same time and a new, and they elected a new single pope to kind of try to end it. Um, so just, just understanding where the Catholic church is at this point. And then we're in 86 to 89, which is what I really did want to read about because I think this is a little bit more interesting. So it's Wycliffe overseeing the English Bible translation, which, you know, um, grandma Jan and uncle Ed, this, they, that's who they work for. And this was what they did. So I thought this was very interesting. So a tall, thin figure covered with long light gown of black color, the head adorned with a full flowing beard, exhibiting features keen and sharply cut, the eye clear and penetrating, the lips firmly closed in a token of resolution. So stood John Wycliffe before the Bishop of London in 1377, answering charges of heresy. His friend and supporter, John of God, Duke of Lancaster, strode arrogantly into the church. A discussion as to whether Wycliffe should stand or sit became an argument. It turned into a brawl. John of Gaunt fled for his life. Um, one can imagine Wycliffe himself being whisked away by friends. Such was his life. He was bold and outspoken in theology and scholarship. But when it came to politics, he was caught in the middle of other people's battle. He was the leading scholar of his time. Throughout England, people respected his wisdom. University education was still a rather new phenomenon. And Wycliffe may be largely responsible for the early reputation of Oxford, where he studied and taught. His life, however, was marked by controversy. He had a dangerous habit of saying what he thought. When his studies led him to question official Catholic teachings, he said so. He questioned the church's right to temporal power and wealth. He questioned the sale of indulgences. Remember, those were letters um, that would pardon sin. So you could actually buy a forgiveness for your sin. He questioned church offices, superstitious, superstitious worship of the saints and relics. So he's a Protestant that's really questioning the Catholic faith. He even questioned the official view of the Eucharist or communion, especially transubstantiation which remember was that the body is actually is actually um, Jesus's blood and bread. He regularly had to defend himself before bishops and councils. England was full of sentiment against the Roman church, even in the 1300s. Secular leadership was strong in Britain. The princes and many commoners resented the way that the church grabbed for power and wealth. John of Gaunt often used Wycliffe's ideas and reputation in arguments with the church. In return, he granted Wycliffe a certain protection from the hierarchy. For a time, Wycliffe was a popular hero. His followers, the Lollards, were priests who took an, on apostolic poverty and taught the scriptures to the common people. So that's a really big part right there, actually teaching the word of God, would travel England with the gospel. But as his influence declined, he became less and less useful to his benefactors, which are the people supporting him with money including Lancaster. That, uh, I don't know who Lancaster was. Who did it say Lancaster was? I don't remember seeing that name in here, but it says including Lancaster. The brawl ridden hearing, oh, that was the hearing. That was the hearing in, um, in Lancaster was that hearing that he was at. Um, the brawl-ridden hearing in 1377 resulted in a ban on his writings. Opposition intensified. While he himself was kept from violence, his writings were burned, and he was stripped of his position at Oxford and forbidden to disseminate his views. This gave him time to work on his Bible translation. Everyone, everyone Wycliffe or Wycliffe maintained should be allowed to read scripture in his own language. For as much as the Bible contains Christ, that is all that is necessary for salvation. It is necessary for all men, not for priests alone, he wrote. So despite the church's disapproval, he worked together with other scholars to translate the first complete English Bible. Using a handwritten copy of the Vulgate, which is like the original, one of the original scriptures, he labored to make the scriptures intelligible to the countrymen. A first edition was published, which was not completed until after his death, yet that edition became known as Wycliffe's or Wycliffe's Bible and was distributed by the Lollards. He suffered a stroke in church and died in December 31, 1384. 31 years later, the Council of Constance excommunicated him, and in 1428, his bones were exhumed, burned, and the ashes scattered on the river. No one knew how swiftly his ideas would scatter through Europe. The effect of his teachings on later leaders, such as John Huss, Hughes, earned Wycliffe the name the Morning Star of the Reformation because he's, he's bringing the scriptures to the people, right? And saying everyone needs to be able to read scriptures, not just the priests. Uh, he himself managed to stay within the Roman church all his life, but in the hearts and minds of his, of his um, hearers, 
the Reformation was already quietly underway, and the Reformation is going to be sort of where the Protestants um, sort of become a thing. And then we've got John Huss, who was burned at the stake. So we'll cook his goose. The man of whom those words were spoken was John Huss, whose last name meant goose in Czechoslovakia. He who spoke the words referred to the fact that he would be burned at the stake, but as state and church authorities condemned him, they lit a fire of nationalism in church reform. So we're in 1401, which is like 70, uh, no, sorry, like 30 something years after Wycliffe died. He was ordained as a priest. He spent much of his career teaching in Prague. Um, although John Wycliffe's land lay far from Bohemia, his influence had spread there. After English King Richard the second married Anne, sister of the king of Bohemia. Anne had opened the way for Bohemians to study in England. Thus, the reform-minded writings of Wycliffe had trickled into Bohemia. Hey, John. Hey, John. Can you tell me where Bohemia is? Is it southern Germany area? Okay, I think that's right. Southern Germany area. On the walls of Bethlehem Chapel, paintings contrasted the behavior of the popes and Christ. While the pope rode a horse, Christ walked barefoot. Jesus washed the feet, the Pope had his feet kissed. Such clerical worldliness offended Huss, and he preached and taught against it. By emphasizing the role of the Bible in church authority, he lifted biblical preaching to an important place within the church service. Again, preaching of the scriptures. His teachings became popular with the masses and some of the aristocracy, including aristocracy, including the Queen. As his influence in the university grew, the popularity of Wycliffe's writings increased. The Archbishop of Prague objected to Huss's teachings. He instructed him to stop preaching and asked that the university burn Wycliffe's writing. Huss refused to comply, and the Pope, and he was condemned. Um, pope John the Twenty Third, one of the three popes in the Great Schism, placed Prague under interdict, an act that effectively excommunicated the whole city because no one there could receive the church sacraments. Huck agreed to leave Prague to help that city, but he continued to draw crowds as he preached in churches and held open-air gatherings. He had brought about this clerical opposition not only by denouncing the immoral, extravagant lifestyle of the clergy, including the Pope, by asserting, but by asserting that Christ alone is head of the church. In his book, which is called On the Church, he defended the authority of the clergy, yet claimed that God alone can forgive sins. So we're getting to see some of the, the splits here that's going to occur between the Protestants and the Catholics. Catholics think the Pope needs to be present. I mean, the, the, the clergy needs to be there to forgive sins. And Protestants, of course, think we can go directly to Jesus. No pope or bishop, added Huss, could establish doctrine contrary to the Bible, nor could any true Christian obey a clergyman's order if it was plainly wrong. In 1414, Huss was summoned to the Council of Constance to defend his teachings. The council had already made up their mind about it. He was arrested as soon as he arrived, and both Wycliffe and his writings were condemned. He refused to deny that he had stated that when a pope or bishop is in mortal sin, he ceases to be a pope or a bishop. Orally, Huss added the king to that list. Um, Sig Sigismund had called the council to rectify the great schism, and they accomplished that. But naturally, no council that restored the pope's authority would acquit a rebel who questioned the pope's right, the pope's authority. So wasted by long imprisonment, illness, and lack of sleep, Huss still protested his innocence and refused to renounce his errors, quote unquote. He proclaimed to the council, I would not for a chapel full of gold recede from the truth. So on July 6, 1415, the church formally condemned Huss and handed him over to the secular authorities for immediate punishment. On his way to his place of execution, he passed a churchyard where a bonfire had been made of his books. Laughing, he told the bystanders not to believe the lies circulated about him. When he arrived at the place where he would be burned at the stake, the, Empire mar the empire's marshal asked Huss to retract his views. God is my witness, the churchman replied, that the evidence against me is false. I have never thought nor preached except with one intention of winning men, if possible, from their sins, and today I will gladly die. His ashes were scattered on a river. Instead of harming his prestige, his courageous death increased it. Fired by a combination of religious and national fervor, his followers rebelled against the Catholic Church and their German-dominated empire. They effectively overthrew both. Despite all efforts of the popes to stamp out movement, it survived as an independent church, the unity of the brethren. And, uh, sorry, I, I wanted, John just corrected me. The Bohemia is a historical country that was part of Czechoslovakia. Um, since 1993, Bohemia has formed much of the Czech Republic. So it is in Czechoslovakia. Thank you for that, John. And um, just looking. Oh, okay. Um, and I think we'll call it on there. I don't think I'm going to go through the questions. Um, 
that are on there because I think that, that was a really clear passage. So that is the end of the chapter.